All right, we are here for another Ask Me Anything session, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, those who ask questions will hopefully get answers. You want to get them in early on uh, because they will pile up fairly quickly as, as viewers come in and start asking things. So for the first hour, I will take questions more or less in the order that they're being posted. And then um, maybe the last half an hour or so, I will probably be taking questions. There we go, put a little more light on. Taking questions uh, in order of interest. I won't get to everything, but uh, we never do. Um, we do these once a month for those who, who want to know how they can get in on it. And you can always find when these are going to happen posted in the Reason.io events calendar. That's my company's uh, website, reason.io.com. Or you can find it in my Facebook author page under events. So um, while people are lining up questions, um, I'll say just a little bit about uh, what's been going on this last month. You know, it was uh, International Stoic Week. Uh, we had a Stoicon X event here in Milwaukee. Uh, that went quite well, and we also um, had, you know, Stoicon X events all over the world. I participated in uh, remotely in the Stoicon X Brisbane uh, event. Um, I did a video for them, which you may have seen in, in the channel, and then did a Q&A by Skype. Um, all right, so we've already got a question here. Um, hey there, Dr. Sadler. Why are book one and two of Aristotle's metaphysics so hard? Well, um, because it's metaphysics. <laughs> you know, it's not. Uh, it's not going to be easy. I'm trying to get things lined up here so I can get a bit more stability. Here, let's try it like this. That's much better. Um, you should. You know, there's there's really two things going on, or maybe three things. One is the first thing is that Aristotle is trying to engage with all of his predecessors, and um, that is quite a doing. Any any time that you're doing a history of philosophy, you're going to be doing it in terms of the concepts that you're most interested in, right? And so. Aristotle is thinking in terms of the causes that he is putting forth as, as really a, a new innovation on his own part. And he's, he's rereading um, what's available in the history of philosophy in that way, um, through that lens, you could say. There's also the fact that Aristotle is, is writing in a technical language, which is often the case for metaphysics. I'm gonna see if I can move this chord a little bit to help me out. Um, so, you know, anytime that you've got a technical language, it's going to be a bit trickier. There's concepts that have to be learned. Uh, you have to understand the relationship of the words to each other. There's also the danger when we're looking at English translations or, you know, whatever other language you're reading it in of, um, taking the terms in a way that's that's quite different than what we're normally used to. And this doesn't just hold for Aristotle, this holds for all these other thinkers that we might read as well. Um, and then, you know, metaphysics is inherently difficult. So anybody who claims that they can make it easy is, is bullshitting you. And you should probably ignore them. Any You know, a lot of those like channels and books that claim to make everything simple um, they're really selling you the philosophical equivalent of snake oil. And, you know, epistemology is difficult too, and even ethics is difficult, even though it bears on, you know, practical everyday things. Uh, when you're doing real ethics, it's quite, quite tricky. All right, let's take the next one. Uh, Martin Heidegger defined philosophy as the science of being. What do you think that means? Well, I think it means what, I think Heidegger means what Heidegger says, so, you know, he has this notion of being capital B and beings uh, lowercase b and the totality of beings. And he's not coming up with that idea by himself. You know, metaphysics, Aristotle says, is the science of being qua being. 
Um, Heidegger happens to think that metaphysics is indeed, as Aristotle thought, first philosophy. And so it's, you know, it's an investigation into the different modalities and types of beings and trying to understand capital B being. So, um, you know, that's pretty straightforward. Here's a question from Shaf Ali Khan. What books would you recommend for beginners in Stoicism? I always recommend primary texts. Um, I mean, again, you can you can choose like, you know, Stoicism made easier, Stoicism for dummies or any of that sort of stuff if you want to, but you don't know whether you're actually being led astray or not. You should read Epictetus, you should read Marcus Aurelius, you should read Seneca. They're readily available on the net. Um, you know, you should probably start, if you want like short texts, um, read one of, you know, Seneca's shorter texts and couple that with Epictetus's Enchiridion and um, <clears throat> then read, you know, Aurelius's Meditations. And then you'll want to go back and read the longer texts like Seneca's, you know, full letters to Lucilius. Um, also sometimes called Seneca's moral epistles. There's a lot of different, uh, you know, translations and editions out there. And you want to read Epictetus's discourses. And then you want to go further in reading other things, but those will get you started. All right. Um, we already have a lot of questions, so I got to scroll back up. Mark asks, on human nature, do you believe that it's unchangeable over time or is it contingent upon the society and time period? Neither. Um, I think that human nature is incredibly complex and it's also somewhat open-ended, um, but I don't believe that it's because of that merely contingent on the society and time period. I think there's some constants, but that very often what we take to be like total constants turn out to have some contingency to them. Um, and we, I, you know, I would say that it's not that the ordinary person or even the intelligentsia of this time necessarily understands human nature better than they did, say, in the early modern period or the um, high Middle Ages or, you know, in antiquity. Uh, there's some things that are better, some things that are worse. I would say, actually, our modern psychology is, uh, for the most part, if we're sort of looking at the average level, not as not as uh, intelligent about, say, emotions and their relationship to um, our, our thoughts, with exceptions, as some ancient philosophers were. But um, and all that has to do with human nature. Um, you know, I would say that that we, you know, human nature is humans is something that humans realize by reflecting on themselves, the societies that they live in, um, what they take to be constants from the information that they have. And we never have enough information. And um, it's sort of, you know, it is a construct, right? But it's a construct that does correspond to something out there. But it's so incredibly malleable and open-ended because, you know, we are the creature that has much fewer... Uh, instincts. This is one reason why I think evolutionary biology and psychology, for the most part, is is uh, wishful thinking or, or you know, uh, people kind of bullshitting around and oversimplifying. Again, with that, with exceptions, um, we don't. You know, we're not like all the other animals. Once you start introducing um, culture into the mix, uh, it gets incredibly more complicated, right? So, there we go. Um, William asks, I've been getting into John Dewey and Richard Rorty. Well, that's what you were going to spend your time on. Can you help me understand what Richard Rorty means by truth is a product of conversation? Key points I should know about pragmatism. Yeah, key points you should know about pragmatism. It's better to read James and Peirce and Royce than spend your time on Rorty and Dewey, I would say. Um, Dewey, Dewey's interesting. I mean, I got so much Dewey when I was at Southern Illinois um, and, and so much of it from people who thought that he was basically like the savior, you know, it's like they were, they were almost like a cult of, of Deweyans out there. Um, I was never that impressed with Dewey. Uh, I didn't particularly care for his writing. And when Rorty came out and started saying things, you know, based on his sort of bringing together Dewey and Wittgenstein and Heidegger, I, you know, my, my, um, response was, so what? Yeah, we kind of realize this stuff. Um, so, you know, truth is a product of a conversation. What does that mean? 
Um, it means that, that uh, in part, I mean, he's not saying that all truth is a product of a conversation, right? Um, and, and, you know, pragmatists, even though they have like a pragmatic theory of truth, it's not that they think that the correspondence theory of truth is just totally off base. There are some things like, you know, whether coffee is in this cup or not, that could be true or false based on how things are, right? Um, but there are quite a few things that are where truth is a product of conversation. And Rorty isn't the first person to notice that. I mean, we, we, if we use different terminology, we could say that Hegel noticed that, or the whole dialectical movement noticed that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, pragmatism, um, it usually works best when it's not just taken on its own, I would say, uh, when it's tied together with, with some other platform. And that's, that's part of what I like about, say, James and uh, particularly Royce. Um, all right, Shah Fali Khan, what do you think about the ship of Theseus? There's not much to think. It's an interesting problem. I, I make reference to it in classes. Lord Awesome Tony, uh, I'm reading Russell's The History of Western Philosophy. Is this a good foundation? Good if you want to be off base on things. Um, I mean, I wouldn't rely on Russell's take on the history of philosophy any more than I would on Ayn Rand. Um, or, you know, somebody was just writing me today about Gibbon and whether, you know, they should, they should keep reading Gibbon or read Descartes. And I was like, holy crap, you know, um, because what's Gibbon known for his history of the fall of the Roman empire, which is, you know, it's a nice story, but not true in many respects. And things can be false in, in, you know, by the emphases, by the, you know, conclusions drawn all sorts of ways. Don't rely on Russell for history. I mean, he's popular, um, but, I mean, if you want somebody from his time who's looked at as a fairly good source that's relied on in graduate school for history of philosophy, Friedrich Cobbleston, you know, at least Cobbleston isn't going to steer you wrong about stuff because of his own biases um, or failures to comprehend what was going on in, in somebody's thought. I'm always surprised that Russell still has so much uh, weight these days. All right, um, McLackey has a question about uh, Kant and the third critique, how exactly Kant solves the antinomy of taste, how to der der derive that from the analytic of the beauty. I don't remember. It's been a while since I've looked at the third critique, so I wouldn't venture to try to, to do that. Ah, here's, here's one good, a good one from Soxus, or maybe that's not how it's pronounced. What should I read after Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit? Also, what are important contemporary major philosophical problems and any major philosopher who's dealing with these major problems today? Um, so I'm going to answer the first one, and I'll briefly answer the second one. What should you read after Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit? You've worked your way through the whole thing. I mean, I'm tempted to joke and say reread it because you know, on a first reading, uh, you you missed probably 90% of what was going on in the text and spent a lot of time saying, "What the hell is this crap?" Right? Um, but you know, I, I would Hegel. So here's what here's Hegel's answer. After you finish the phenomenology of spirit, obviously you have to go on to the science of logic. But maybe maybe don't do that. Maybe save that for a little bit later on. Um, you know, I usually don't suggest that people begin with the phenomenology of spirit. There's two other texts that I think are pretty good for getting into Hegel's ideas um, before you do that. And they're, they're almost, you know, mirror opposites of each other in a way. There's the lectures on the history of philosophy and the lectures on the philosophy of history. Those are much more accessible than the phenomenology. And I think they'll, you know, they cover some of the same ground in, in parts, um, but they'll give you a nice idea about how Hegel sees things and how the dialectic advances and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I actually like his, you know, I like reading his other lectures. I used to do a lot of work on the uh, lectures on the philosophy of religion um, back in the day. And, you know, Hegel is sort of like, like um, Heidegger in that there's a big corpus of, of lectures from class stuff. And, you know, these were lectures he was providing to undergraduates, I think, for the most part, but they're, they're pretty advanced stuff, you know, so there's some real meat there. 
You could go on to the science of logic. I mean, you could always read um, the encyclopedia logic if you want. That's that's quite a bit easier, and you're going to find it covering some of the same ground. And then there's the philosophy of right, which is definitely worth reading. Um, so there's a lot of stuff you could you could check out. All right. Um, oh, just. I just jumped a little bit. Let's see what we got next in the order. Uh, Gabriel, I wanted to ask you if you could explain the concept of Acadia and who I should be reading. So, um, yeah, this is a, a thing that's uh, often referenced in the monastic literature, and it's part of the, the sort of conceptual apparatus of what, what comes later to be called the Seven Deadly Sins after uh, Gregory the Great's uh, Moralia on Job, the Gregory, by the way, who I was named after. Um, and um, prior to that, it's uh, understood as one of the eight capital vices or one of the eight bad thoughts, depending on whether you're reading John Cassian or Evagrius of Ponticus, right? <coughs> so Acadia, um, gets rolled into along with uh, Tristitia or is it is it Lupe? I think in the Greek, yeah, I think it's Lupe. Gets rolled into um, what we call sloth, right? And sloth has always been kind of a catch-all thing. People think of it as equivalent just to laziness, but it's not just laziness. There's a kind of distractedness there, an inability to focus in on one's own work. And the way that, um, like John Cassian, who has a really great chapter on Acadia in his institutes, talks about it. He uses the example of the monk who, instead of like sitting in his, his cell where he's supposed to be and focusing on his work, he's like, you know, I should probably go check on Brother John. You know, he, he could use my help over there. And he's like totally bullshitting himself. Brother John doesn't need his help. He's just like going to find out what, what's going on over there because he doesn't want to buckle down and focus on his own, his own business. Um, Sometimes it's called the noonday devil, right? Uh, meaning it's it's the thing that oppresses us. Think about you know like when you're in your workplace and you've done some of your work, but you're like, oh, I need to take a break. Um, maybe I'll just like you know check social media for a bit, and then like half an hour has passed. Um, that that's a prime example of it. And I I think that that um, social media and the internet in general. I mean, think about when you go down a Wikipedia rabbit hole. Uh, and like two hours have passed and you got nothing done. You were doing research, right? Um, those are those can be expressions of Acadia. And when it's a vice, it really keeps you from being able to get things done. We can all fall into that, but we, we need to like be able to bring ourselves back through diligence and attentiveness to, to what it is that, that needs to be done. Um, so what should you be reading? John Cassian and Evagrius of Ponticus are the classic places to start, I would say. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of contemporary literature uh, out here on it, but I, I don't know it. Oh, go going back to to uh, Soxus's uh, question, any major philosopher dealing with major problems today? Yeah, there's tons of them out there. Um, you know, I talk about Alistair McIntyre all the time, who's still alive and kicking and dealing with major problems in philosophy, uh, mostly in terms of ethics, but also politics and epistemology and other things like that. There's all these great historians of philosophy who are, you know, sort of recuperating ancient thought or, mo or medieval thought or even early modern thought and bringing it to light. You know, I'm a big f uh, fan of, say, Julia Annas or um, uh, Christopher Gill, you know, uh, as examples of that. A. Long is still, still around and still doing good work. Um, John Sellers, um, you know, uh, Margaret Graver, people like that. Lots of people out there doing doing good work. So, all right. Uh, a wild Josh asks, um, "Do I know any of the academics at University of Essex?" I don't. Um, most places, you could probably <laughs> say the same thing. Uh, Antigua, are you a fan of some of Toni Morrison's books? No. Um, I, as a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever read any Toni Morrison book. 
Um, when it comes to contemporary literature outside of uh, philosophy and even in philosophy, I'm not, I'm not very well read. Um, and, you know, things that are, um, things that happen into my hands, I, I'll tend to read them, but I, I don't get a lot of time for reading other things. Um, Jay Tunick, do you think Plato's dialogue Carmi Day shows that he was for pederasty or pedophilia? <laughs> no, I think he was. I think he was using uh, the dialogue. If you read the dialogue, to talk primarily about uh, the question of temperance, so and what what it would be. But um, there's always people that are more focused on the the sexual aspects of the dialogues, I suppose, than others. Um, boy, do you believe in freedom of will? Yeah, but I mean, that doesn't really mean that much since there's so many different understandings of what freedom of the will would mean to people out there, aren't there? Um, so you always have to clarify it. Mason, ever read Thomas Merton? Yeah, of course, I read him as an undergraduate. Um, I was quite interested in comparative religions and, um, you know, monasticism in general. And so I read Merton and, and did my, like, you know, getting into him thing and, then, you know, found him as I found many of the people I think of, of his <clears throat> sort of long generation. Because remember, Merton was, was actually um, not a, a young college student in the 60s, but he was one of the people that they were reading. Um, I just found him and people like Watts and, and all that to be interesting at first and then just kind of superficial um, after a while. You know, there didn't seem to be that much meat there. Um, but I'm not attracted to mysticism, so. All right, Julia, uh, or Justice, Justice Shepard, do you think the really old figures in philosophy like Diogenes were real people? It always feels like there's a bit of mythology the further back you go in the history of philosophy. Yeah, of course they were real people. Um, I mean, there's even people who like doubt, did Socrates exist, you know? I mean, you can find people who think Julius Caesar didn't exist, but that's so far out on the fringe. Diogenes existed. It'd be nice if we had more, uh, you know, texts talking about him. But um, I don't know. I don't know any serious scholars who think that he he didn't. Um, and mythology it really depends on what you mean by mythology. You know, you're talking about like people like Zeus or or, you know, Apollo and all that. <clears throat> I guess if you, if you have a sort of uh, viewpoint that was actually taught, talked about in ancient times that, well, these were just human beings who were then deified. But Diogenes wasn't deified. He was looked at as the second um, leader or some, in some cases, uh, some people think he was the, the actual first leader of the Cynic school. Why well, believe he didn't exist? Um, H-T-A-H-D. What do I think about the cyclical view of history versus the progressive Hegelian one? Um, well, I think the progressive Hegelian one, although false, is probably closer to the truth than a cyclical view of history. Um, I mean, how would, you, how would you actually go about proving a cyclical view of history if it's not all that cyclical then it's not really cyclical. So if the, if the things don't match up perfectly, um, why, why even talk about it as a cyclical view of history? And if they do match up perfectly, um, somehow we'd have like, you know, the eternal recurrence of the same, I suppose. Um, so, uh, you know, the other thing too to keep in mind is whenever we're doing historical analogies, we have to be able to say, if we want to say, well, this is just like what happened back then, and we ignore all the other relevant uh, ways in which, in which it's not the same, we have to figure out, well, which thing is it actually like? So a lot of people love, and I've talked about this before, to say, um, oh, you know, what's going on in American culture, just like the fall of the Roman Empire, you know? And, you know, if you know much about Roman history, you'd be like, yeah, not really like that. Um, what would be better analogies? I've mentioned this again in, in AMAs many times. The closest analogy that I see to where we are uh, historically is what's laid out in William Shire's The uh, Decline and Fall of the French Third Republic. 
read that if you want to understand um, where we're headed. Um, that's probably the, the, the closer analogy. It's not going to be ancient Rome or things, you know, way the hell off like that. I mean, what was going on in France at that time? Totally deadlocked political system, unable to respond to uh, massive inequalities and, um, you know, clear economic rot within cronyism, um, generals who were basically hamstrung uh, by civilian leaders and unable to uh, oppose the threat when it came or sometimes too craven to deal with it, uh, way overextended military budgets and alliances and things like that. We forget, you know, it's really funny that the people are like, yeah, the French are surrender monkeys. Man, if you were around in, in 1939, um, you you wouldn't view things that way. You know, France had developed an entire network of alliances uh, hemming in Germany for, you know, uh, several decades. And they, you know, bled and lost a lot of their manpower in the First World War, but they also were able to still field a pretty sizable army. They had more tanks than the Germans. They were just weren't being used effectively, you know. Um, if you want to make historical analogies using a cyclical view of history, you got to really know a lot of history in order to be able to do that, I think. All right. Um, Frey Lanks, why do your Twitter posts seem unstoic like when discussing politics? Because I don't claim to be a stoic. I mean, if you think, you know, if, this is so funny because um, there's two things going on. First off, you probably don't know what real stoicism is if you think that opposing rot, corruption, you know, that sort of thing is unstoic because you clearly don't know anything about Cato or, you know, the, the Stoics who opposed Nero or anything like that. Um, but I don't claim to be a Stoic. And if you think that I do, you obviously don't know much about me or my background. Um, people always, this is, is going to be a side note rant. People always like think that they know so much about me by like, you know, finding out one thing. Oh, he's the Hegel guy. He must be a Hegelian, not a Hegelian. Just happened to do the half hour Hegel project because nobody else was. Um, I edit Stoicism today. At one point, I worked for a Marxist institution. I'm not a Marxist, right? I've been a fellow traveler on, on many accounts. And I can do that because uh, when I see, you know, institutions and movements that are actually doing something worthwhile, um, I'm willing to, to collaborate with them. Uh, also, when I see bullshit and evil, I'm willing to call it out as it is. So, you know, the other thing I'll say too about stoicism is that although I don't call myself a stoic because I'm not, you know, just committed to, to stoicism, and I'm a Ciceronian eclectic who uses stoicism, Aristotelianism, Platonism, existentialist thought, you know, brings all these things together. I probably know more and practice more stoicism than most of the people out there self-identifying in the present as stoics. Um, so those are all some, some useful, I think, answers for that. Kramer's asked the question a lot of people ask, thoughts on Carl Jung? Interesting writer. I think that his psychology is, you know, false. Uh, I don't believe in archetypes or anything like that. Uh, most of the Jungians who I've met have been pretty nutty. Um, you know, he's he's the sort of person, again, we're talking about eclecticism. He's the sort of person that I think it's useful to draw insights from, but they'd better be insights that you can actually tie into more than Jungianism uh, or else, and, and more than just new age nonsense or else uh, you're kind of wasting your time and, and playing around with, um, you know, wishful thinking stuff, you know, wouldn't it be nice if the world was like this and there were these deep down archetypes and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm, you know, Jung is a fun writer to read. Um, Colin Poor, have you read Austin Sense and Sensibilia? If so, how much linguistic theory do you like to read? Yeah, I read Austin way back in graduate school. I haven't read him since. Um, how much linguistic theory do I like to read? Um, I like to read it when I can get to it, but most of it is not analytic philosophy stuff. The, the analytic philosopher who I like most to read is John Wisdom. Um, I teach Wittgenstein in my classes occasionally. Um, you know, I, some of those earlier uh, writers are, are fun to, to check out. 
I don't read much a contemporary analytic philosophy because I find most of the stuff that I've, I've read and been recommended to be so jargon heavy and, you know, we're only going to talk about what, what these few writers over here have done and so, you know, unbased in, in the history of thought that it's just not worth my, my uh, spare time to do it. Um, that said, there's a lot of great um, philosophy of language outside of analytic philosophy. Um, I'm a huge fan of Umberto Eco's semiotics. Um, you know, I also really like uh, Kyle Perlman's uh, new rhetoric. Uh, I can't even pronounce his his collaborator, Olbrex Tanita or something like that. That's an amazing book, right? And of course, if you're studying Heidegger, or you're studying Hegel, or you're studying Aristotle, or you're studying uh, even Anselm, there's all this uh, brilliant discussion about language in these people. So. Um, yeah, like I said, you like to read a lot of linguistic theory. Um, Gabriel, reading the science of logic, and I think after reading over and over, I understand the general development. That's good, uh, but I have a lot of trouble exemplifying or thinking concretely what I read. Well, that's that's okay. Um, I think the science of logic is harder than the phenomenology. That's my experience with it. I can't say that I have been able to successfully apply much of what I have read in there myself. So I just stick with it. Uh, revisionist show, you appeared on Zero Books, a leftist podcast interview with Douglas Lane. Would you say that you identify with the political left? If so, what are the reasons why you identify with the left? Um, you could probably ask that question about the rightist podcasts and things that I've appeared on too, right? So it's funny that you zero in on zero, zero books on the left. Um, I'm a virtue ethicist. So that means that I'm not comfortable on the right or the left. And that I think that probably 90% of the people who identify with either are just full of crap and actually probably bad in many respects. And that would be similar to what Aristotle says about people in his own time. You know, in Aristotle's time, he framed it in terms of the poor and the, the many. Uh, and he said, they're both full of crap. Um, they both think that they they have, you know, the interpretation of justice, and it just so happens to be one that favors them and their interests and the aristoi, the people who are actually uh, best equipped to rule, are the ones who are least likely to engage in social stasis or faction in order to uh, try to try to grab power, while these other, sh you know, schmucks on left and right or, uh, you know, whatever arrangement we want to have, they're perfectly fine to undermine everything. Right now, I think the right poses more of a threat. That hasn't always been the case for me. In the past, I've been more disenchanted with the left. But right now, especially with the rise of Trumpism and um, what I see as actual, you know, uh, tendencies towards fascism in his regime and in others, uh, as well as, you know, here in Wisconsin, the just absolute cravenness and, you know, griftiness of the Republicans who have been running this state for a while. And, and you know, most of what's going wrong in this state is due to them. Um, I'm willing to line up with them. I'm a registered independent, but I'll be most likely voting straight Democrat this, this coming election. And I'll definitely be voting against Ron Johnson when he comes up for election in 2022. Um, and so, you know, if you want to see that as lining up with the left, you can. For me, it's always <clears throat> a matter of who's the biggest threat, who's the, the ones who are most damaging the, the common good. And right now it's the right and the Republicans. So not to say that there aren't, you know, plenty of uh, uh, nonsense things going on on the left, but we only have so much time. So I'm, I'm more willing to devote it to discussing where the uh, right is going wrong right now. But if you know anything about me, you know that in the past I've been, you know, equally critical of the left. So, all right. Um, JDR93, what do you think about people using philosophy in the corporate world for purely utilitarian purposes? If they were purely utilitarian, they would be doing something very different than the rest of the corporate world because pure utilitarians like Bentham or Mill or Sidgwick or even Singer are genu genuinely going to be, generally going to be, uh, 
opposed to the sort of things that go on in corporations. So what you probably mean is sort of like reductive, uh, uh, you know, things, instrumental, right? Um, what do I think about people using philosophy in the corporate world for purely instrumental purposes? Um, a lot of them. I mean, that's how I actually sometimes smuggle in some good philosophy. When I'm doing work with corporate clients, I don't tell them that it's coming, the stuff that I'm doing is coming from Stoics or Aristotle or Thomas Aquinas until they ask, you know, and then I say, yeah, this anger management stuff came from these other thinkers and um, it can make your organization work better. But if you want it to work better, you actually have to start thinking in terms of virtue ethics. So I, I don't think that, that you, you can really use philosophy in any substantive way just for purely instrumental purposes. It winds up being a gateway drug to better things. Um, now, if you mean like, you know, watered down stuff, like what's going on with a lot of stoic things today where people are doing coaching or, you know, they have their program that you can buy or something like that. Um, then uh, it's not really the philosophy, right? It's just sort of a, a sort of a residue of, you know, whatever they've happened to study. And there's plenty of hucksters out there doing that. Um, and what are you gonna, you know, what, what am I going to do about that? <clears throat> not much. But, you know, that sort of stuff doesn't really survive that long. Um, it doesn't have much staying power. They end up just saying the same things over and over again. And, and when they run into genuine problems, they can't really deal with them. And that's when people come to people like me and they're like, um, hey, I tried working with this and um, it gave me a nice introduction, but I don't know what to do after this. And I'm like, well, okay, now we're ready to really study, aren't we? Um, so that, you know, that's what I think about it. Shaf Ali Khan, do you think Machiavellianism is a moral philosophy and practical for rulers? I don't know. If it depends on what you mean by Machiavellianism. If you mean just like, you know, um, little maxims, like it's better to be feared than to be loved or stuff like that, um, then probably not. I mean, well, it's a moral philosophy in the sense that it's saying that, that some things are better than others, but, you know, it's not a good moral philosophy or an adequate one. Um, I mean, the real Machiavelli um, thinks that the rich and the powerful are a bunch of, you know, a-holes. Um, he says so right in The Prince, if you actually read the text. And he says that they will inevitably try to oppress the poor and the many, and that the poor and the many will try to, you know, re revolt against them. And he says, don't be like one of them. So the people who are like, Machiavelli tells me I should be ruthless and, you know, exploit people. He says, if you're going to do that, you better be really, really prudent about it and not look like a, like a jerk because when the, when the people revolt against you and won't, won't work for you and somebody else gobbles you up, it's your own damn fault. So, yeah. Um, absurd Hero, you once said that Camus was hostile towards Christianity. Exactly how intense was his hostility? Depends on the work, you know. He was hostile towards what he understood as the Christianity of, of his time. He, I mean, he thinks that it's essentially a cop-out. He also knew plenty of people in his own time, and there's plenty of them now who are hypocrites and use Christianity as a way of controlling people or not to deal with their own BS or, you know. Um, so, you know, he's hostile to that. He never, he never really, I would say, in, in his works, as far as I can tell, has any moments where he considers it a genuine possibility for um, himself, although his, his absurdist ethics in, in Mythosyphysis doesn't actually rule it out uh, completely, depending on how we interpret it, right? Um, and there are some figures in his, his uh, works that um, are Christians that he has a rather, you know, if not... Um, totally endorsing their, their points of view, at least, uh, you know, not entirely hostile viewpoint on, because Camus is a complex thinker. Uh, Chilke, ever got the chance to read some Dubois? I've had the chance to teach Dubois. Uh, du Bois is how it's supposed to be pronounced, but, you know, coming from a French background, it's, it's, it's really tough not to read it that way. Um, yeah, I've, I've read him. I, you know, I taught African American, Africana philosophy, uh, when I was at Fayetteville State University, and I read him some in, in uh, graduate school as well. Um, 
I enjoyed it, you know. Um, Letromere, you often you seem often to say I don't buy into X metaphysics, into whose metaphysics you buy into most. I don't know that I actually say I don't buy into X metaphysics. Um, but whose metaphysics do I buy into the most? Um, you know, I'm an eclectic, so I don't really have a, a single one that I, you know, I get. You know, I, I suppose if you want to say, you know, something like that, it would probably be somebody like, you know, Mark Shaler or Maurice Blondell, um, right, where persons are absolutely central and, and values exist, you know, but – you know, I, I bring together all these other things. I'm willing. I'm willing to be quite uh, Catholic in the lowercase c about my metaphysics, as I am with my epistemology or my ethics. Uh, scapegoat mechanism. Have you seen any new movies that are philosophically interesting? I haven't yet because I haven't watched any. I haven't watched a lot of movies lately. Um, TV shows. I could say yes. Um, there's an Australian TV show about a hitman called um, Mi Mr. In Between. My wife is whispering that to me in, in the background um, that we've been watching that has got a lot of really interesting, um, not just moral dilemmas, because I think that, that a lot of people think that writing a good show is it should have some moral dilemmas in it. There's got to be like genuine pathos of character to make the moral dilemmas stick. And it's gotta be filmed right too. And I'm seeing that, and we've only seen like the first, I don't know, maybe four or five episodes of it, but I'm really, really impressed with it so far. Um, obviously Westworld, you know, I'm looking forward to the next season coming out. Um, like watching Rick and Morty with my kids, we get, get into some good discussion about things. We even play the board games based on it. You know? um, what else? TV shows. Um, you know, that superhero one, The Boys, that was that was pretty decent. I'm kind of looking forward to seeing where they go with that. The, the big challenge is like the writer's not screwing it up. Uh, it's so easy to screw up um, movies and and TV shows in the way that you write it and, and who the pro, you know, the antagonists are and how things develop. Um, and there's quite a few TV shows I'll mention as well that I'm really disappointed that they, they didn't get continued. Oh, you know, another one that we did, did watch, uh, it's been a while since, since we've seen it. That was really quite good too, was the expanse. Um, I understand it's based on some books that I'll eventually read, but it also really strikes me as being whoever wrote these books is really indebted to C. Uh, C. J. Chera, uh, great science fiction author, uh, whose works I really enjoy as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I also like you know a lot of funny TV shows like Always Sunny. Um, I don't know. We can say that. I mean, they never really learn anything in it. They do develop a bit, but yeah. All right. John Samuel, what are your thoughts on Thomas Reed's principle of common sense? Um, haven't read Reed since grad school, so I don't have anything to say about it. Uh, Antigua, any preliminary reading required to read the divine comedy or can I dive right into it? You can dive right into anything. Um, just, you know, expect that sometimes it's going to be rather challenging. So with the divine comedy, you probably want some useful commentary. Who, who provides that? I don't know. Because, I, you know, again, I, as I say so often, I don't spend much time on secondary lit because, um, you know, I'm usually reading primary texts. And even when I'm teaching them, I'm teaching my students, so I don't need to give them secondary lit other than maybe some encyclopedia entries because I'm going to talk about what's going on in it. Um, Zo Lowell Z. Doodles, have you read Gregory Palamas? What are your thoughts on Orthodox philosophy and theology? I haven't read Palamas. Orthodox theology and philosophy, um, there's a lot of Orthodox thinkers that I, I do draw upon, um, you know, that I read, but um, 
if you're talking about like contemporary stuff, I don't, I don't really bother with it. Um, I don't read much theology anyway, quite frankly, you know, um, I don't read much Catholic theology or Protestant theology these days. Now that I'm not teaching religious studies classes, um, I will say this, the Orthodox definitely have like a beef with Anselm that's usually based on bad glosses and, and not actually reading him. David Bentley Hart has a great piece on uh, why that's the case. Um, so, yeah. All right. El Edralin, if solipsism were true, in that case, would that make you God? Well, it might make you you God or somebody else, right? means that there's only one one ultimate being and everything else is sort of a figment of that. So, you know, maybe maybe we'd all be just figments of somebody's vast imagination. Uh, movies, clips, and songs suggest me English language encyclopedia. Not even sure what you're asking there. Titus Andronicus, do you think Aristotle's work should be labeled as sexist? I mean, you can if you want. He says some really dumb things about women. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't reduce his work to being sexist because... His work actually contains um, stuff within it that you can use for combating the, the obvious sexism in his work. I mean, if you had Aristotle here today and he were to talk with a bunch of typical college students, he'd probably be more impressed with you know many of the female college students than he would with the male ones. And then he'd revise his ideas because he was a smart guy. Um, Lyndon asks, do I have any time for the extended mind idea and embodied cognition? No, not really, um, because, you know, I, I haven't read enough of that literature to even really have a, a, an opinion on it. Um, so, I mean, if it's along the lines of, like, Merleau ponty noting in the phenomenology that, you know, the, the blind person senses through the cane, um, uh, not, you know, simply by means of the cane, then sure, I'm cool with that. But I, I don't know exactly how far the mind's supposed to extend. Uh, Amakita, to what extent is Hegel driven by Herder's understanding of spirits? I don't know. I, I haven't read much Herder. So uh, Dominic has a really interesting question. Who is your least favorite philosopher? Least favorite. Um, like the one I think is the worst. Um, that's a tough one because, you know, I can usually find something worthwhile in anybody. Um, it would need to be somebody who's like wrong most of the time and just not, not, you know, worth reading at all where like just reading them makes you need to like take a shower afterwards. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I will say this. So what pops in my head, uh, it, maybe because of the needing to take a shower is, is when I read Dasan, I was super disappointed because I think I, you know, I read him in high school because everyone said, oh, it's so, so, you know, so terrible. So, so dirty. Right. And the pornography in Dasan was really just boring as hell. Um, even later when I read it in French in, uh, graduate school, Pretty boring. Just like let's, it's sort of like a, a person basically taking a bunch of Barbie uh, dolls with anatomically correct parts and saying, "Let's put them together this way." Now let's put them together this way. Have them whip each other, you know. And after a while, you're like, "Wow, this this, this mechanics is really dull." His philosophy parts are, you know, more interesting, but they're very predictable, you know. Uh, like as soon as you know that they're bad guys, you, you had a good idea what they're going to say. So. Yeah, that might be part of it. Uh, John Kalbuska, who, if anyone, evolved Kierkegaard or contemporized him? Sartre, Heidegger. Heidegger draws, you know, quite a bit on on, on him. Jaspers, uh, the whole existentialist tradition in, in many respects. Um, to some, it depends on who you're reading, of course. I mean, if some of them didn't, uh, because they, they didn't like Kierkegaard, but... There's plenty of Kierkegaard scholars out there in the present. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's even a book uh, that was devoted to um, contemporary Kierkegaardians arguing why Alistair McIntyre had Kierkegaard wrong in uh, After Virtue that was done by the I don't know, Kierkegaard Society of America or International Kierkegaard Society. 
I don't really remember who. So there's plenty of people out there still working with Kierkegaard. Uh, Andre Gamito, any thoughts on Byung Chul Han? No, because I don't I don't even know who that is. So um, let's see who else we've got. Some other people just jumped in. Um, boy, a lot of questions here. Um, including some that look like they got flagged. Maybe they're swearing or something like that. Um, YouTube will, you know, get you for that. Uh, Tawadros, what's the relation between philosophy and the history of philosophy? Um, well, if you ask me, they're, they're, they interpenetrate each other. If you ask an analytic, you know, there's real philosophy and then there's history of philosophy, but that's because they don't know any, usually they don't know any actual history of philosophy. Uh, and they use it just as sort of a place to put the, the stuff that they, they don't think is making a contemporary contribution. But a lot of times they're like repeating the past. Um, I tend to think that, you know, you develop as a philosopher in part through engagement with other philosophers. <clears throat> and why would you deprive yourself of the opportunity to study some of the great works of the past who are, you know, quite brilliant and can give you some distance and, and perspective on our own era? Um, now, there's different ways of doing history of philosophy. Like, you know, one of my one of my colleagues says, I'm basically interested in figuring out where the ideas of the person came from. And, you know, when I hear that, I'm like, well, that's that's fun. You know, that's good intellectual detective work. That doesn't tell you really much about like the totality of their ideas or whether they're applicable in the present or have any import, you know, more broadly speaking. Um, but, you know, that's the way some people do history of philosophy. Um, so it really depends on, on what, you, what you mean by that. Uh, Ali Edrelin, does Cartesian philosophy align more with Hindu doctrines or Buddhist doctrines? Neither. I mean, Hindu doctrines, what do you mean? Hinduism is like a whole umbrella for a whole bunch of different uh, religions and ideas. Um, you can't be relying on some sort of like encyclopedia entry on Hinduism for what Hindu doctrines would be. It, it, whose doctrines, right? And you can say the same thing about Buddhism. I mean, which particular school, right? And I, I don't, I don't find this this sort of comparative work on that sort of grand scale particularly um, interesting or, or helpful. Um, Michael asked, "Do you have advice for someone practicing living in accordance with anger for anger with nature for anger management, but their family members let their anger get the better of them and don't support me controlling mine?" Well, yeah, um, don't expect your family members to support you is step one. Um, and if, you know, part of, so if you're referencing this living in accordance with nature, you're probably thinking in terms of stoicism and the first lesson for anybody who's practicing stoicism that often has to be learned, uh, over time, very difficult. The rest of the world are not stoics because you choose to be a stoic so <laughs> or practice stoicism. Um, so you, 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 you know, you better like realize early on that they're probably, you know, and if you go around, and this is why Epictetus says, don't tell people that you're studying philosophy. If you go around and you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this new thing. Uh, please support me. And they're a bunch of pricks. They're going to like push your buttons even more. Right. So um, I wouldn't do that. I, I would, um, you know, think about um, here. Here's one thing. Think about uh uh, Epictetus is dis, uh, not discourses uh, and Caridian four. Everything that you do, ask yourself, what am I actually trying to do here? Am I am I trying to get this out of the situation, this out of the situation, or am I willing to let those things go so that I can keep my proiracis in accordance with nature, my faculty of choice? Um, and with anger, if you have anger problems like I do, you are going to lose control of your temper at times. And then the question is, well, what do you do afterwards? You know, beat yourself up over it or pick yourself up and start again. Um, the more that you do it, the, the longer um, time will, will pass in between lapses. 
And, uh, you know, eventually you'll, you'll develop more and more control over it. I did, you know, a, an entire workshop. You, you can watch the video for, for that. I did an entire workshop at Stoicon 2016 on Stoic techniques for dealing with anger. So that might be helpful for you. Um, Lyndon Bailey, do you think the seeds of the concept of ideology are there in Hegel's work? Uh, whose concept of ideology is the question, right? There's multiple ideas about what ideology constitutes. You mean Marxist notion of ideology? Where it's tied in with like, it's a misrepresentation of the world that also perpetuates that. Yeah, I guess you could say that's there. Um, in each of those, you know, particularly in the phenomenology, in each of those like uh, dialectical stages, the gestalt, and I guess you could say that um, that's, you know, each one of them represents a kind of ideology in a way. Um, I already answered one about Jung, so I'm going to skip over is Ixo's question. Uh, Andrew Weiss, what is my favorite 80s one-hit wonder song? Um, that's a good one. One-hit wonder. Um, who's, a, who's a good one-hit wonder? Um, I mean, Golden Earring had more than Radar Love, right? Let me look them up. Because uh, that, that was a big one that got played a lot. Um, I mean, there aren't that many bands whose one hit wonder, no, they had Twilight Zone, yeah. Um, so obviously they're not a one hit wonder. Oh, they're Dutch, I didn't know that. <coughs> I don't know, I'd have to, I, that, that's a tough one, I'd have to think about that. Um, let's see here. William, any thoughts on a good way for a secondary English language arts teacher to include philosophy in their classes? As a college prof, are there any philosophers you wish secondary students knew before college? Those are good questions. Yeah, so um, if you think about like core areas of philosophy, there's a lot of ways you could work in um, secondary English language arts. Okay. So you could think in terms of like uh, argument and presentation and what philosophers, you could use some of their stuff as raw material and you could also use some of the things that they say about, you know, argumentation or bias or things like that. I mean, think about like Bacon's uh, Four Idols, right? That could easily be turned into a little module that you would you would teach in class and then use to to discuss things and then talk about contemporary examples. Um, are there any philosophers that they they should know, but by the time that they get to college, I don't think that there there's any that you know would be like the one that you need to know. <clears throat> it's just introducing them to the idea that there's this whole discipline of philosophy out there and that they're typically not getting it in their K through 12 education and that it's worth studying. And, and you know what I had also stressed to them in other civilized places, right? Uh, all across the world, people are studying this in K through 12. So it's part, you know, studying philosophy. If you're not just going like a technical school route, for the places that, that differentiate between the sort of a technical path and an academic path, they usually will have some philosophy in high school, sometimes even in middle school. Um, so that, I think that would be, you know, quite good to get across to them. All right. <clears throat> Joe asks, I just stumbled across your channel. I find it very interesting and very detailed. I'm not a philosophy major, nor have I read anything to do with it before. Where do you suggest I start? Always start with Plato, you know? Uh, and then go on wherever you want from there. Um, I've got a whole series of, of uh, videos that I keep adding to each month, although I didn't make it this last month, of um, self-directed study in philosophy, focused on different thinkers, movements. So you can, you can take a look at that. Uh, Dakota, why is Hegel and German idealism in general looked down on by so many Catholics? It's not. <laughs> I mean, most Catholics don't know anything about philosophy, period. 
Um, I don't know where you're getting this from. I mean, most 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 Catholics, like most Protestants, like most Orthodox, like most people in in most religions, don't know anything about intellectual life. <laughs> so it's, it's always been kind of an elite thing. Um, oftentimes they'll get like a little smattering of it in education, but it totally depends on who's who's leading it. I mean, if you mean Catholic, do you mean Catholic thinkers uh, look down on Hegel and German idealism? Some do, some don't. Um, you know, uh, there was even the Tübingen school, right, uh, who was using Hegel. So I'm, I'm not sure where that, that's coming from. Um, Lalit Bora, favorite contemporary novel. I don't know. Um, probably, I imagine it'd probably be, well, I guess, you know, uh, Dick is contemporary, right? And my favorite novel by, by Philip K. Dick is Scanner Darkly. So I guess that would be it. Lenny Penny, did, did I read any psychology? I read a lot of psychology. Psychology came out of philosophy. Um, I've actually published work on Jacques Lacan. So, <laughs> yes, I, I read a little psychology. Uh, uh, Lowell Z. Doodles, thoughts on Kripke's naming and necessity. It's okay, you know, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, it's, uh, it's a work in analytic philosophy. Um, R01, what about a series of philosophy of rock or metal similar to the world of speculative fiction? I know you like those genres. So Worlds of Speculative Fiction is a talk series that's hosted by a local library where I and the other participants read um, books by a particular author pertaining to a particular narrative universe ahead of time and then um, discuss it in the session I'm not quite sure how I would translate that to rock or metal, right? Um, and it would be absolutely impossible to include excerpts on YouTube that wouldn't get me copyright flagged. So I'm not sure how that would work uh, either. But you know, I, I do have—I haven't contributed to it for a long time, but I do have when I when I have the time my heavy metal philosopher blog, and I might shoot some videos for it down the line, but it, it would be, uh, you know, it would be a, a long time. All right, we're now in the, I'm going to jump around and take stuff that looks particularly interesting. Um, so we'll see what we've got. I'm actually going to scroll down a bit and grab some stuff from down below. Um, all right. Uh, Carnal delusion, what's the ideal age to start philosophy? What age did you gain exposure to philosophical works? Would you have preferred to have begun earlier? No, I'm cool with, you know, where I am. Um, I, I didn't gain exposure to philosophical works early on, but I was fortunate in that I had quite a few people in my life who, you know, they, they were thinkers. My, my dad, my mom, um, some of my other relatives. Um, I had a few good teachers here and there. And I actually did a video a while back on teachers who had been very influential on me. Um, and, you know, the first actual philosophy book that I, I encountered was uh, Camus' Mythosyphysis. Um, as I mentioned, I probably understood maybe a tenth of what I was reading, you know, and then I, you know, I was quite interested in, in um, world religions. <clears throat> and so I did, you know, quite a bit of reading from the local library and books that I could get about um, different, you know, made major world religions, primarily, you know, uh, Buddhism and, and Hinduism in my, my teens. Um, you know, and I, I read I read books like Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance that people suggested to me but didn't find them all that compelling. I was reading a lot of things, too, about, you know, um, games and stuff that was sort of like on the, on the border of, of philosophy and, and uh, the notion of game when I was in high school, too. And then, you know, I went in the Army, and, and uh, I remember buying a – some cheap, like, you know, summary of philosophy book um, that was 
interesting in parts and boring in other parts, but we were always talking about stuff, you know? Um, so now is there an ideal age to begin? Uh, no, there isn't. It, it really depends on the person. Like, you know, my kids, for example, obviously as somebody who has a stake in philosophy, I'd like to introduce them to that. Um, but sometimes they're interested and sometimes they're not. And they're not, not always interested in the same things that I am, you know, um, and having a sort of light touch with it means that they'll come to me when they want to know stuff rather than seeing it as something that dad is pushing on them. So, um, Hal Tuberman, do I see any overlap in Plato's tripartite soul and the structure of the human brain as understood by neuroscience? Parts of the brain which can be in conflict with one another? No, nah, not really. I, I'd, I'd avoid trying to <clears throat> make these things line up too neatly. I mean, people do that with Freud too, you know, oh, the tripartite soul looks just like Freud's, you know, uh, 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 id, uh, ego, super ego. Well, I mean, the id and and the, the appetites look kind of similar, but not the rest of it. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to line these things up, you know, into a one-to-one -one correspondence that way. All right. Um, <coughs> Retro Gamer, October 13th, Catholic Saint John Henry Cardinal Newman, who's canonized, right? Is this positive ramifications for philosophies in today's society? Well, for philosophy, that's a tough one. Not many people read Newman, even in Catholic institutions. Um, you know, it's funny, too. I'll, I'm going to say this. There's a lot of people who think that a Catholic institution is – you know, like what Catholic institutions were like half a century or an entire century ago. I'm going to point, so Marquette is over that way, right? Just 12 blocks from here. You can go to a place like Marquette University and you can take the intro to, or the, the foundation, it's now called Foundations in Philosophy and Foundations in Theology and stuff like that class. And you can be part of its Jesuit mission and have just the, the most superficial contact with um, the entire Christian intellectual tradition, let alone, you know, Catholic, let alone Jesuit um, traditions. Mm -hmm. And that's really the case at many Catholic institutions of higher learning. There is not an awful lot of genuinely Catholic thought going on. And, and sometimes when there is, it's kind of the moribund, you know, neo-scholastic stuff, like learn this because it's part of the culture war kind of, kind of nonsense. Or it's the, it's all relevant, you know, it's all like, you know, social justice man sort of sort of stuff as well. And there's not, I mean, there's very few people reading John Henry Newman, um, even at places where there's, there's a genuine respect for the Catholic intellectual tradition. So I don't, I don't think it's going to make much impact on, on American um, educational institutions. And if it's not going to make much impact there, I don't see it making a hell of a lot of impact at the level of parishes or, um, you know, the larger society. I mean, it's a cool thing, but I mean, from where I sit, I don't really care about canonization or stuff like that. Um, myself, it it's, it's become such a, long and ritualistic process it it doesn't it doesn't really mean much to me um i mean i i've been reading newman since well since graduate school and i like the guy um i think he's quite interesting in many respects um but i you know i'll read him whether he's canonized or not it doesn't add anything by him by him having that weight um, maybe there's some people who will take it more seriously because of that, but you know, what are they actually going to, to do? What are they going to read? I suppose it's probably a big thing for Newman, uh, centers, right? It, uh, those who don't know, um, on like state school and non-Catholic school campuses, there are often these places that are called Newman centers for, for Catholic students. And, and sometimes they're quite good and sometimes they're, they're not so good depending on who the staff is and you know what, what's going on there. Sometimes they offer cool programs and all that. 
So I, I bet it'll give them a boost. So that's kind of a cool thing, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, let's see who else we got here. Um, uh, do, do, do. Here's an interesting uh, comment. Eric Busi, feelings and affects produce reasoning fallacies, but that's also what allows a human judgment, able of empathy. Artificial intelligence seems the Plato's dream of rational government. Scary no. Well, Plato doesn't think that there would be a rational government that didn't have feelings. As a matter of fact, when you read the Republic, uh, take a look at book nine. The rational part has desires and pleasures of its own. So it's not as if it's like cold calculating, that's all there is to it. And the, the human beings who are guardians are not all rational part. They have a proper ordering of their highly developed rational part to their also highly developed thumatic part to their also well-developed, properly developed appetitive part, right? Um, artificial intelligence would be something very different from that. And you're right, um, the emotions and affects, they often get us in trouble um, sometimes they even hijack rationality, but they are also quite important. And so, you know, when we look at thinkers like Plato and the entire Platonic tradition or Aristotle or the Stoics, uh, the Stoics aren't for a totally detached, cool, calm rationality that has no affects whatsoever. Um, there's, there's an attempt to have an integration of affect and, and intellect. So, yeah. All right. Um, Let's see who else we got here. Henry asks, do I consider Ayn Rand to be a real philosopher? Uh, it depends on what we mean by real. If, if we're setting the bar pretty low, yeah. I mean, she had training in it, and she wrote books that are philosophy. They're recognizable as such if we're being sort of objective about this, not objectivist, but objective about this, um, they're not particularly good philosophy. Um, her history of philosophy is terrible. You know, the whole world's basically divided in this Manichaean way into like, you know, the good uh, empiricists and the, the evil idealists and, you know, uh, collectivists and all this, this sort of thing. And it's just nonsense, you know, and her, her take on Aristotle is, is not a good reconstruction of Aristotle's own thought. Um, she has, you know, bizarre things to say about Kant and Nietzsche and people like that. Um, and, you know, she, um, you know, she is espousing a, a coherent philosophy. We shouldn't, we shouldn't dismiss it we should actually engage it. That's why I teach her in my ethics classes so that people have a, a good representative of what egoism really looks like. Um, and then we say, is this sufficient? Is this where we wanna be? And, and then we, we move on past that. Um, I think where a lot of her fans are really problematic is in that they think that what she's doing is actually good philosophy and they don't then read other stuff, unfortunately. All right, let me jump around some more here. Um, Cuttlefish, is the gulf between continental and analytic philosophy and other schools like process and pragmatism a problem? Is there a hope of bridging it? It's always bridged. I mean, there's people who've been doing that for a long time. Paul Ricoeur, and Jürgen Habermas on the continental side, well, yeah, deliberately engaged analytic philosophers in their own time. Um, John Wisdom was a, a analytic philosopher who, you know, read psychoanalytic literature and read existentialist stuff and engaged it. Um, there's always people doing boundary crossing like that. Robert Brandom right now is a prime example of somebody who starts out as an analytic and, um, you know, is doing work on German idealism and now is really more of a histor good historian of philosophy than an analytic philosopher because he actually reads the texts and thinks about them. So, you know, there's, there's always the possibility of going beyond it. I think part of the problem is that it's not just that there's like analytic philosophy, continental philosophy, and then whatever else we want to have. 
it's like analytic philosophy is think about it as like having its own little weird kingdoms inside of it where people never venture out of that. It'd be sort of like saying, you know, um, can people ever get from Chicago to Milwaukee? Yeah, they do it all the time. There's even like just blocks from here, the Amtrak, where you can take the, the train or the bus down to do that. Um, but there are people who only live in their own little neighborhood in Chicago or in Milwaukee and rarely venture forth. And obviously those people, they don't even know their own city, let alone the other city. Um, and I think there's there's lots of people like that in continental and analytic philosophy. There's lots of people who say I'm I'm, a, I'm doing continental philosophy. And you're like, cool. What do you think about you know Maurice Merleau Ponty? Oh, we never read him. Oh, really? Mm, that's too bad. Um, how about Mark Shaler? Oh, I haven't read him either. Oh, yeah, okay. How about Henri Bergson? Who's that? Oh, didn't Deleuze write about him? Yeah, Deleuze wrote about him, but you could actually read his own, you could read his books, you know, just to check them out on your own so that you know what he's saying. Um, there's people like that in, in continental philosophy, and there's people like that in analytic philosophy too. So, all right. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, Plato's Republic, does Nietzsche's philosophy pair up to Nazi ideology in any way? Or was his writing completely reworked enough by his sister to line up with the ideology? Why so extreme? Why not, you know, a little of both? Um, I mean, as, as Chomsky pointed out recently when asked about Peterson, um, you look close enough and you'll find some things where Chomsky and Hitler have some things in common, right? So the better way to, to frame this is, is Nietzsche's philosophy substantively uh, aligned with with uh, what the Nazis did with things? And the answer is no, um, except in you know in a generic sense where the Nazis could be a stand-in for any sort of like might makes might makes right under the proper circumstances philosophy, right? But then it loses distinctive Naziness. Nietzsche thought that that you know sort of the sort of pan-Germanism and anti-Semitism of his time was a sign of bad character. And he criticized both pretty extensively. His, his sister, of course, was a uh, very committed anti-Semite and, um, you know, did, did rework his, his stuff. Um, but the Nazis weren't relying primarily on Nietzsche. I mean, they, they had their own philosophers, um, and uh, they weren't even really relying on Heidegger. I don't think most of them understood Heidegger, <laughs> frankly. Um, you know, if you actually read their literature, um, it's, it's not like, for the most part, it's not very high level stuff, you know. It's stuff that's designed to like uh, have a certain point of view that you can, you can use to mobilize the masses. Nietzsche's tough to mobilize the masses with, right? The only, um, the only uh, society in which I really see that sort of thing happening is like science fiction societies, like in Andromeda. If any of you have ever seen that TV show, right? There's there's a Nietzschean character, Tyr or something or other, um, and there's like a whole Nietzschean race. But that's that's like way in the future, right? And it's actually interesting because they they tie together Nietzsche and Ayn Rand in that. All right, uh, revisionist show. What are your thoughts on error theory and moral anti-realism? How would you refute these two views from the lens of virtue ethics? Um, you know, how would you refute that? That's sort of like, you know, the debate me bro kind of mentality. Um, I don't think that you do refute points of view like that, especially isms. Um, I think that you you look to see what a life like that would would look like, and then you see where its gaps are, and you start pointing out, well, maybe you want a little Aristotle here, or some Stoicism here, or some you know McIntyre, something like that, to actually live a a life that was is going to work for you. But it's, it's very rare that people like get you know some sort of critique or argument, and then they're like, holy shit, I was totally wrong. Now I'm going to change my position. Error theory, I don't know enough about it to really say much. Moral anti-realism, um, 
it depends on what you mean. I mean, th that's one of those things where people are kind of like all over the map. Anytime you get an ism, it's tempting. There, there's this problem of what we call metonymy, right? <clears throat> metonymy is, is a uh, literary device, strictly speaking, where a part substitutes for the whole or the whole substitutes for the part or a part substitutes for a part. So who's moral anti-realism? Is it this person's view of it? In that case, that being blown up to be it in in general, you know. Um, so we got to we got to specify this a little bit, but I think that you know the way that virtue ethics works. A lot of people act as if like you're going to lay it out in terms of axioms and make a bunch of arguments, and then people will go, "Oh yeah, yeah, I see," you know, and so they'll talk about this argument and that argument. Um, it really works by a dialectic between living a life and developing, you know, some sense and, you know, of moral consciousness and where you've been wrong and, and how you can get things better. And this is exactly what McIntyre says in After Virtue and in his other works, you know. Um, so does Yves Simone, by the way, too, a um, uh, French Catholic thinker uh, who has some very interesting things to say about virtue, uh, part of the, the, you know, you could call it the you know, Nouvelle Theologie movement. So, all right, uh, we got about 10 minutes left. Let's, uh, let's take some others. Eminon, which philosopher from the post-structuralism should I read first to get the basic ideas of this movement? There are no basic ideas of this movement. There is no movement. Um, there are at least five of them, and I'm confused. Post-structuralism is a label that's applied, meaning after structuralism, right? They're all over the map, you know? Um, if you want to read Foucault, well, uh, you probably need to read some Nietzsche first. And because Foucault says that Nietzsche was instrumental in his thinking. And then also read some structuralist stuff. If you want to understand what post-structuralist is, then you need to read some structuralism. So read de Saussure's course on general linguistics and read some A.J. Grimas uh, and read some Levi Strauss in his anthropology, right? Um, and that might get you going. Um, if your goal is to understand Deleuze, well, then maybe, you know, the, if Deleuze is, is actually post-structuralist, um, then you need to read some of the people that Deleuze is referencing, <clears throat> right? It's not going to make much sense to, to read Anti-Oedipus without knowing a good bit of Freud, and not just Freud per se, but Freud is interpreted by the French psychoanalytic establishment of the time that, that they're reacting against. There isn't any like easy way in with, with that stuff. Um, so yeah. All right, let's see what else we got here that I might successfully grab. Um, do, 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 do. Jason Holmes, do you like black or death metal? Not much, um, not really interested in most of the genres of you know later metal except for doom and um power and uh yeah a little bit of a little, some contemporary thrash i guess um definitely interested in the new wave of traditional heavy metal right? but I, I i'm not into a lot of the the, the genre stuff um let's see here Oh, here's a good one from John Ortiz. Should one get a PhD in philosophy from a low tier if one cannot get into a top tier university or, or should you not get a PhD at all in philosophy? So if you want to teach, <clears throat> which is really the main reason to get a PhD in philosophy, I think, unless you're independently wealthy, you probably want to go to as high tier an institution as you can not because it actually deserves to be a high-tier institution, not because the education you'll get there is actually better, but because of the way that this BS job stuff works, people care about prestige. That's all there is to it. The upper-tier graduates bogart most of the available jobs, um, and that's been going on for several generations, um, and that's just the way the game is played. So, you know, if you, if you want to do something else with it, you know, then maybe it doesn't really matter where you go to. Although you're going to find that people are really into prestige anywhere you go. There's ways around that. You can publish a lot. You can form important contacts, you know. But unfortunately, pedigree matters. 
shouldn't, but it does. Um, all right. HTA HD. I've heard some mentions of Heidegger being an existentialist. Which part of his philosophy caused this association? The very fact that in being in time, Heidegger uses the word existential, right? Uh, over and over and over and over again. The only reason why there's anybody dissociating Heidegger from existentialism is because of Sartre and his wish, his drive to try to control the existentialist movement um, by uh, trying to define it in such a way that made him be at the top and others below. Heidegger, after reading Sartre's stuff, said, <clears throat> you can keep the term. I'm, I'm going to you know, sort of divorce myself from uh, any sort of humanistic thing that you have going on. Uh, Gabriel Marcel also, who, by the way, is the first person to use the term existentialism in French. Gabriel Marcel uh, abandons the, the term existentialist and prefers, a, after a certain point, to call himself a Christian Socratic. Um, but this is really more of a PR stunt by, by Sartre um, that got taken to be sort of a doctrinal thing by, by English language writers than anything else. Heidegger is an existentialist uh, in, in, you know, the important respects. Um, Leib Baki, what do I think about nationalism and ethno-nationalism? Should countries or groups of people have self-determination? Two different questions there. You can have self-determination without having ethno-nationalism. I think that ethno-nationalism is, in most cases, a virulent form of, of ideology that we've seen many times before. Um, people make all sorts of, you know, arguments for how it's going to be different this time. Um, and um, I, I don't buy it, you know. Um, so that's probably enough about that. Um, let's see. Oh, I, I answered one about this side in here. Um Let's see. Oh, here's a good one. Mr. Big Weak Knee. To what degree can we hold people accountable for lacking character virtues? I'm sorry this is so broad. That's a great question. Um, some people we can hold less responsible. You know, so think about people who suffer <clears throat> terrible abuse. And uh, could be, a, you know, like actual physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. Could be neglect of some types. Um, it's often going to be coupled with, you know, not just like suffering those things, but being given um, bad role models and mistaken understandings of the world and what people are like in it. It's it's like a whole package that you get. Obviously, they're going to have they're going to be way more at a disadvantage than somebody who just grows up in, in American consumer society in general, um, but has you know a fairly high degree of autonomy, right? We're not going to hold them to the same standards, but here's where I think Aristotle's distinction between um, theoriotes or brutality uh, and uh, um, vice, which he goes back and forth sometimes uh, using different terms for you know uh, weakness, you know, or um, uh, kakia badness, right? I think this is useful. So the vicious person is morally worse than the person who's been so damaged that they, the higher part is, is, you know, sort of out of commission for the time being at least. But this is more terrifying, Aristotle says. So there's a different kind of badness to it. Um, and, you know, when we're offered opportunities for developing virtue, and um, we, we may you know, outright reject them or we may sort of appropriate them in ways. You think about people who like want to acquire virtues like they want to get merit badges for their Boy Scout or Girl Scout thing, things they can check off, right? They're not really becoming virtuous. They're, they're in it for the wrong reason. Um, sometimes out of a sort of desperation to like, you know, be able to think of themselves as a good person. Um, sometimes because they want to hold it over others. 
Um, all of these are, are things that stand in the way of virtue. And, and I think we, you know, there's no like blanket thing that we can say, like ordering them into like a hierarchy of, well, this is worse, this is better, that sort of thing. But we can apply them to particular cases and we can talk about types, I think, with that. So, you know, the answer is in some cases we can't hold people responsible at all because they were, they were in conditions where it's just not going to be feasible to expect them to develop virtue. If it does happen, it happens through something like divine grace or, you know, some total perfect coincidence of, of events that take their brokenness and screwed up and like give exactly what they need at the time. And that's pretty rare. But everybody else bears, um, you know, scaled levels of, of responsibility. <clears throat> the other thing I'll say about this too is as you progress towards virtue, you also become more conscious of how screwed up you are, you know, what, what more needs to be done. There's a lot of things that you can't actually see that you need to work on until you've established enough of a foundation and enough freedom to be able to, to take them on. So, yeah, uh, that, that's actually a good thing to close on. So I didn't get to everybody's questions, but I never do. Um, we'll do this again at the beginning of next month. I'm um, going to try to do uh, some uh, philosophy pop-ups this month now that I'm not quite as busy. I'm still super busy, but not quite as busy. And we've got some other events coming up throughout the month as well, including another video premiere that we'll be doing on uh, the uh, self-directed study in philosophy uh, once I get that video shot. And, um, yeah, hopefully I'll see some of you in some other events. Um, and uh, those whose questions I didn't get to, maybe hold on to them for, for next time. and. I'll try to uh, get to them then. Um, we all These things are always announced ahead of time, both in my social media and on my calendar. So, all right, I hope everybody has a good wherever you are, evening, morning, day, uh, middle of the night, and I'll see you later on.